Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to present uh, uh, some work, recent work on the data driven coordination of distributed energy resources. Uh, so it's not working. Okay. So uh, today's presentation will cover uh, essentially the uh, framework which we use to coordinate the DRs and also uh, uh, within which some of the algorithms we do uh, we used to do the estimation and control and also we'll show it's uh, the convergence of the proposed algorithm as well as some numerical simulation to illustrate the application of the proposed framework and in the, uh, in the end I'll make some uh, concluding remarks and uh, uh, and also discuss some of the potential future works. So, as we are all aware that there are uh, increasing uh, trends of uh, deploying dip distributed energy resources, uh, short for DER, uh, in the microgrid. And uh, the DERs in a microgrid uh, footprint might be uh, operated by an aggregator, and uh, also they might possibly owned also by the aggregator. And these DERs, uh, typically, we have a very small capacity uh, for each single one. Uh, so if they need to, if they uh, uh, cooperate together and they can collectively provide some resource to the bulk grid through some tie line uh, uh, via which they are connected to the bulk power grid. And uh, the problem that we are attacking is how to coordinate the set of distributed uh, DERs so that they can collectively provide some resource to the to the uh, to the uh, bulk grid and uh, essentially this is actually encouraged by the existing uh, market schemes in most of the United States electricity markets for example they can participate as a, as a demand response resource or as some frequency regulation providers and uh, the problem is that uh, the, the setting is that uh, the aggregator of the DRS we will receive some signal which asks them to provide some request a number of uh, resources, for example, active power or reactive power. And uh, then the aggregator need to coordinate the DRS in, uh, then so that the total provided resource will match the request number. So the problem is uh, quite straightforward. And uh, here, the if we know the exact uh, microgrid model, then this is very trivial. So since we can directly solve the uh, optimi uh, op optimal power flow or, some, or just power flow problems to achieve this. But the problem is that we may not know an exact power flow model. Actually, for microgrid, we may not even know the model. And so the problem, the setting we are considering is that we don't know the actual microgrid model all we know is that uh, the active and the reactive power injections from the DRs, which we can measure, and also the uh, uh, some loads, active and reactive loads, and also the power exchange at the timeline, which is essentially the total amount of resources supplied to the bulk grid uh, collectively by the DRs. And uh, conceptually, we can, if we go back, we can think of this power flow on this timeline. Uh, as a function of all the inject power injections inside this block, inside the microgrid, and uh, represent as a conceptual function f. And uh, as we, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't know the exact form of f. Actually, even we, even if we are given an accurate model of the power system, it is very hard to get a, a explicit expression for the f, since it involves a lot of function inversion, all this stuff. So. Here, uh, we also, uh, to simplify the notation in, in the following lecture, uh, in the following slides, we just define the PG, which is the active power injection from the DRs as U, which is a symbol for control, something that we can control. And also we denote the, uh, the rest of the uh, power injections from loads, from the, uh, and all, as well as the reactive power injection from DRs as some pi, which is some parameter. Uh, which we will assume to be constant for the during the interval of our control. Equal to three point. Mm -hmm. Three point one. Oh no, not that pi. <laughs> this is a vector. Is that legal to define something that changes? We don't have to call it pi. Yeah, I, I think the, 
They also define some uh, projection operator as pi. Yeah. Pi is a p for Greeks anyway, right? Yeah, it's it's just a p. Pi is also very nice for parameter. Yeah, because p is already taken here, so I use pi. Anyway, so uh, as I mentioned that the, the explicit form of f is unknown, but we can make some assumptions f. Uh, so the assumption we make, the first assumption we make is that the f uh, is differentiable uh, and uh, its first order partial derivative with respect to the u, uh, which we also call them sensitivities, linear sensitivities, uh, are, lies in some interval uh, b1 under bar b1 over bar. Essentially, we, uh, we claim that the, pre the derivative, the first order derivative of f is bounded in some uh, in some box, and the, the bounds we can just make some guess. Essentially, if in the worst case we can assume that the the lower bound is zero and the upper bound is is like large enough. And also, in addition, we also <coughs> assume that the first order <coughs> partial derivative is a Lipschitz function, which means that the change will be bounded if the input is bounded and with the parameter b two. So this Two, what does this assumption mean? It, it essentially means that uh, if we inject some power into active power into the microgrid, then there will be some positive power provided to the bulk grid, which is very intuitively uh, reasonable. And the, assu the assumption, the second assumption we make is that uh, the controls are fast enough so that uh, during the time, during the time window when we are doing the control, the, uh, all the other parameters, they remain the same. That's why I use a pi to denote their parameters rather than variables. So based on, <coughs> based on this assumption, we can essentially linearize the function f as uh, uh, in this form, which is a, uh, lin uh, which is a linear time varying uh, input output model uh, because it essentially takes the input which are the controls and the output and uh, uh, the parameterize them using a linear function with a parameter phi. The phi is a time varying parameter, which are essentially the partial derivative of f with respect to the control u. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, some uh, result of the mean, uh, mean value of zero. So that means that three is an exact expression, right? This is exact, yes. So because of because you are using the mean, mean value zero, yes. Yeah. So 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 the mu k the derivative is taken as some mu k that right. might be lie in actually uh, to be exact it's a linear combination of these right, two right, 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 right. endpoints and vectors. Right. So this is an exact representation of this system, although f is not known. And uh, the problem is that since f is not known, then we are not able to know phi directly. So then the uh, objective of the DR coordination is uh, are the following. First, we need to estimate the LTV IO model, which I just called IO model in, in, in later. So we need to estimate, estimate the parameter phi, and also then we need to do uh, we need to determine the values of u such that the output yk will uh, check some signal y star. So here I consider y star to be I assume y star to be a constant signal because during the time window that uh, we are doing the control that uh, the the loads are assumed to be constant and the and the only thing that is changing is a u so we can check the y star for that time window and when the y star is changed for example after uh, another five minutes or so then we can check a new target which. I'll show you in the uh, numerical simulation. Not so, just the, not just the loads remain constant, but also the reactive powers, conditions, yes. everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the framework is pretty straightforward. We have a microgrid, and we take measurement, and we need to design a estimator which estimates the parameter phi in the I/O model, and we use the estimated parameter, which are essentially the sensitivities. To do to uh, do the control to determine the set points, active uh, power injection set points of the DRs, so that the uh, hopefully that YK will t 
tend to uh, Y star after some time. And, uh, the, and in order to estimate the parameter phi, we uh, formulate it as a, a, a very simple quadratic uh, optimization problem, which essentially aims to minimize the mean squared error of the, uh, between the actual output YK and the estimated output or predicted output using the, um, using the model. And, uh, and, we, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also we project the phi to the interval uh, which we assume it's bounded in. So here, uh, it's un unlike uh, maybe the conventional uh, estimation problems, this, this formulation is quite uh, myopic. It only looks at the time step, one time step k. And uh, it may seem uh, not promising in order to, to get a good uh, estimation uh, result of the uh, phi, but it turns out that this is pretty good since we are doing it iteratively, which I'll show later. And in order to do the control, again, we formulate a very myopic uh, objective, which is uh, to minimize the uh, squared error between the target and the predicted, uh, the predicted uh, output for the, no, for the next time step, k plus one. And uh, note here that the, since we don't know the exact value of phi, we use the estimated value of phi, which is obtained from the by solving the previous problem in the, estima in the estimator, then these two together forms this loop. Uh, so far, any questions? Good. And uh, uh, next, I'll uh, propose some algorithm to solve this problem alternatively and uh, iteratively. So. Uh, first, I set up some notation. So define the checking error at time instant k as the difference between the actual output and the, the target. And also the estimation error vector, this is a vector, uh, as the a bit, as a, uh, difference between the estimated parameter and the true parameter. And actually, uh, we, I need to point out that this ek is, uh, is uh, uh, accessible to the operator because you can measure both. You know y star and you can measure y, but the estimation error uh, you cannot know. You, you're not able to know because you don't know the true value at, and it, it, uh, phi k. Also, we define some uh, some difference between two time instances. Delta y k as the difference between y k minus y k minus one. Similarly for delta u k. And also define a projection operator. So the projection operator essentially project the, a vector to a subspace, to a convex subspace. Then, uh, and also uh, we do some preparation work. Uh, be aware that the, form, uh, the cost function JE, which is a cost of estimator, and the JC cost of controller, <coughs> they are partial derivative with respect to the variables, uh, uh, like in this form. And uh, then we can propose the algorithms. So a very simple algorithm is, use, uh, is to use the gradient projection algorithm, which is essentially the gradient descent uh, plus some projection. Because if you only use gradient descent, <coughs> this might exceed the bounds. So you need to uh, additionally uh, <coughs> project this uh, result into the bounds. And essentially, here, Q is a box constraint, which means if this is larger than the upper bound, then fix it to the upper bound. If it is smaller than the lower bound, then fix it to the lower bound. And again, uh, similarly for U. But this formulation has some problem when you try it out in, in, in simulation or in experiment. <coughs> because <coughs> this, as we know, that this EK is a scalar, right? And uh, this phi k, if we initialize everything in, in uh, everything in the beginning, if we initialize phi k, for example, to one, to all uh, all the phi k we initialize to one, then uh, this phi k will always be the same if delta u, all the entries of delta u are, are the same. And uh, also, this will result uh, in the 
this 5K has uh, all the same entries, then again, the U will update to a new U, which also has the same entries on it, at these, all the indices. Then this, we are not able to uh, actually find the exact value of phi. <coughs> in order to avoid this so-called collinearity in the, in the injections, uh, we introduced a random perturbation to the controls. <coughs> Essentially, the idea is pretty simple, that in, uh, instead of updating you simultaneously all the time, we just, uh, <coughs> we just introduce some random perturbation in the sense that some of the U's might be updated, some, or some others may not, and each of the U, the control will be updated only at, e at each iteration, each of the U, will be updated only with a probability of 0 0.5. And this, uh, actually this is, can uh, guarantee that uh, the U will be very uh, diverse. The all the entries of U will be very diverse so that the uh, injections will be, uh, will not be collinear in the sense they are not aligned, uh, which we'll see uh, the result from the numerical simulation. And this is a summary of the coordination algorithm. Uh, essentially, we just do an one step for the estimation uh, uh, using the gradient projection uh, update. And then we use the updated uh, estimated value of the phi to do uh, one step of control. Then this will be repeated uh, to the end. And uh, uh, here are some convergence results using the pre uh, previous uh, control and the estimation rule. Uh, the control rule is uh, refers to the one with a random perturbation. Then with appropriate choice of the step sizes and uh, beta k here and alpha k here. That uh, and assume if we have enough capacity, then the control will converge in the sense that the total provided resource will converge to the request amount and the actual value, uh, the estimated value of phi will converge to its true value. Uh, in uh, almost surely sense, essentially means it can, in reality, it will always converge. So uh, next up, just present some of the simulation results. So uh, I used a test case uh, from IEEE 133 bus, and I, uh, this is a modified version, which I only use one phase, a single phase uh, diagram. And is from red or you, you coded all this up? Yeah, I did it on my own. And uh, the DRs, they are, I don't know, oh, are they clear? These green dots, they are the DRs, they are nine DRs, each with a capacity from zero to 40 kilowatts. And uh, I, uh, I just randomly guessed that the, the lower bound of the sensitivity is 0 0.8, the upper bound is 1.2. This means this means that if we inject one unit of uh, active power as some and any of the uh, nodes, then there will be at least 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.8 unit per, uh, power provided to the timeline, and at most 1.5 unit provided to the timeline. These are all three phase lines. One phase. All single phase. Yeah, single phase. Yes. All the same phase. Uh, n n not really, because there are some. So there's some missing data in the original three phase one. So I need to, like, uh, for some nodes I use the phase A, some nodes I use phase B loads. Yeah. Mixing them together. Huh? Yes, but the uh, the line parameters I use the same phase, yeah. unless there's no uh, phase A, for example, no phase A at some particular particular line, then I use uh, phase B to replace it. So you generated the balance version. Yes. By using. <laughs> data from one phase, basically. Yes. Essentially, the same approach that uh, Brad right. did in one of the papers. Right. And uh, this is the tracking <coughs> performance. Uh, that uh, Essentially, the y-axis is the DR active power output, and this is a time instance. As we can see, that there are some step, uh, essentially, which means that, for example, here, that the, uh, the DR at bus 99 does not update. Whenever it's flat, it means that it does not update at that particular uh, iteration. And, and this is uh, 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 
the tracking error. So the tracking target is actually 300 kilowatts. Uh, keep in mind that we have nine DRs, uh, each with 40 kilowatts, so 360 in total. The target is 300. Then uh, these are some of the convergence. Uh, these are the tracking error evolves as time goes. Uh, which we can see they converge pretty fast. And this uh, uh, here I show the impact of the control step sizes, uh, which is intuitive. As we can see, the uh, smallest step size gives the slowest convergence rate, uh, which is reasonable if you walk faster. Uh, each of the steps walks longer and takes much less time to, for you to achieve the target. And this is an estimation on accuracy. As, uh, in the beginning, I initialized everything to be one. And uh, then they will, after, uh, they will just jump around and uh, find eventually converge uh, to their true values. And uh, I also compared the impact of the step sizes in the, uh, in the estimation step. The black dotted line is the uh, one that with the uh, proposed uh, step size. And uh, the others are the constant step sizes, which is very intuitive. And also, uh, also uh, uh, one point I forgot to mention earlier is that actually, uh, in order to get the good estimate on the phi, you need to uh, take advantage of the control. You need to use the control to excite the system uh, so that the, all the uh, phi's at all the nodes can be actually uh, excited in some sense. And uh, if the control step is large, which means the control will converge very fast, uh, then, then the delta u will go to zero uh, quickly. And that means that it will not be able to excite the system anymore. Then uh, expectedly, the, conver uh, the estimation error will stay at some constant, non-zero constant. So uh, that's pretty much all. And uh, so to sum up, uh, we propose a framework to coordinate the DRs uh, so that they can collectively provide some resource to the bug grade. And uh, the framework will, uh, consists of a, a lin linear time varying um, IO model, input output model, and the estimator and the controller, which are myopic but works. And uh, using the framework, uh, the both the control will converge, and the, uh, both the control and the estimation will converge, almost surely. And uh, these are the true values, which we'll see that, which we saw earlier, that they converge to. And uh, also, there's uh, some, like, if you have multiple tracking targets, if the tracking target does not change so too fast, then still this can work pretty well. And uh, these are the estimation error under multiple tracking targets. Uh, because we already get a good enough uh, estimation uh, accuracy in the previous, uh, during the previous target. So we can, the, the error is, uh, uh, stays low all, at all the following time instance. That's pretty much all. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, I think it's the the one next to it. Yeah, that that one. Oh, it's showing on the other screen. Uh, I think if you go underneath, there's the dot dot dot, and one of the options there is um, yeah. hide from the top. Third from the top. And what does that do? This this is the icon, right? I didn't pick that. Sorry. No, the next one. That one. This one. There. Does not work? Mm -hmm. I think it's showing on the other screen. There's a little box up into the left of your window that says, uh, 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 it? Should, should I bring it over to my other desktop and open uh, Aaron, can you just, just? I don't know. Uh, you click the button that I thought should fix it. Now I don't know what to do. <laughs> I think if you just make one like one of the screen as your uh, yeah, major display. Maybe the capacitor flew off the screen. Yes, like flying all over the place. <laughs> Display settings at the top left. Yeah, display. Second one. One button to go right of that. If you could drop down box to the right of that, I think it might be that box. Swap, yeah, swap. swap. So, there you go. Okay, cool. Finally. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present a uh, high power density uh, power factor crushing circuit based on the flying capacitor multi level boost converter. Uh, so, this is uh, mostly Shibin's work, and I work. I took over Shibin's work after he graduated, and uh, uh, hopefully, I can explain a little bit better than him on some of the <laughs> terms. So, okay, so uh, here's the outline. First, I'll go through like the basic operation of uh, flying capacitor multi-level converter. And then I will uh, identify the, the particular control challenges regarding to the FCML uh, boost converter for PFC application. And then we'll, identify, uh, then we'll identify that the input feed forward control is a solution to, to, to this. And then I'll present our hardware prototype as well as the experimental result. And then I'll, I'll conclude this slide of the presentation. Also, if we have time, then I'll show you some of my work uh, after she being graduated. So let's start with the system schematic. So, um, so from the AC input, we will have a rectifier, active rectifier that's controlled uh, at the line frequency to rectify the input AC voltage to the boost converter, which uh, the boost converter controls the input voltage and AC, uh, voltage and current in phase and boosts it up to a constant DC voltage that's always higher than the line voltage. And then we'll have a large electrolytic capacitor bank at the output to buffer the uh, single phase uh, uh, power position. Uh, so let's first go, go to the most uh, critical part of the circuit, that is the uh, multi-level boost converter. So uh, uh, I'll just quickly go through the operation of this. So uh, this uh, converter operates based on the phase shifted PWM. So each of the switch is controlled with a single uh, PWM signal, and, and six of them are phase shifted 
uh, by 60 degrees from each other, and and then uh, it operates at the same as the same conversion ratio as a regular boost converter. That is like if you if you have a due to ratio of 0.9, then you have a 10 time boost, and here is showing the corresponding PWM waveform. And then at the switching node, you you will have a frequency multipli uh, multiplication uh, effects that the period of this pulse is uh, n minus one. N is the number of levels. Uh, so that's n minus one times of the switching frequency, and the ripple amplitude is uh, n minus one of the uh, output voltage. So uh, let's take a look at how this waveform is exactly generated, being generated. So so for uh, flying capacitor multi-level converter, it has an effect called uh, natural balancing. So each of the flying capacitor from C1 to C5 holds a fraction of the output voltage in an incremental fashion. And so like, let's just take a look at two time frames. Uh, uh, so this is A time frame A. And uh, so like if S1 opens and it's C1 is connecting to a switching node and it's to a ground. So V, v switch is a one sixth of the V out. And then in another time frame, uh, S2 opens and it's also uh, one sixth of the output voltage. And now, so, um, so which, like, and if we vary the duty ratio, uh, so, so the orange line shows the rectified uh, sign is the input for PFC application. And then if you vary the duty ratio uh, across this uh, half line cycle, you will have, uh, like, co like correspondingly, you will have this uh, uh, six intervals of, of PWM signals. And, uh, and that's, that's just a uh, uh, zoom in of this. So uh, what this does is that it, the, if the switching nodes the frequency is n minus one times higher, and uh, the pulse, uh, the pulse amplitude is is uh, n minus one times less than the two-level boost. It means that you can reduce the uh, input inductor, and so this is the this is a paper that uh, quantifies this ratio exactly how how large of a reduction you can get you can gain by increasing the number of levels, and you can see that the the blue curve is the inductor value of inductive volume of the two level boost converter and by by operating at uh, seven level you will have this much reduction uh, so this definitely um, you know helps with the power density but we'll later we'll identify that this actually causes a little bit challenge in the control side on, uh, sorry, on the control side so uh, let's go to the control side and uh, let's say that how let's see that how we can uh, apply a uh, very basic uh, boost converter model to this problem. So uh, we first, because uh, in power electronics we do state space state space averaging model for converters, and then derive a small signal model. So first we need to identify if that works for the FCML boost converter. So we look take a look at the waveform again, and we see the pulse amplitude of the waste, uh, of the voltage at the switching node is uh, V out over n minus one. The post duration is when the switch goes low, so that's n min, uh, one minus d and times the switching uh, switching um, period, and then in doing one switching period, there are n minus one of the of the pulses. So we can calculate the average switching node voltage over one switching cycle of the uh, FCML boost converter. That is the same as a two-level boost converter, which means that we can apply the uh, classic uh, state space averaging uh, model for the FCML uh, boost converter as well. And so here is just the two basic uh, basic differential equation that describes the average model of the boost converter. And then uh, we can obtain the small signal transfer function. That is, uh, first of all, we care about the control, that's due ratio to uh, the inductor current transfer function and then the input voltage to uh, inductor current uh, transfer function. So after we obtain this two transfer functions, we can design a PFC controller that's, uh, that's, that's compensating this, this loop. So um, uh, this is a very classic uh, boost. Quick question. Yep. Can you go back to that? Yep. What's the value are you using? This? Uh, 
Uh, C is uh, 1.5 uh, millifarad. Uh, milli is it your input capacitance, plotting capacitance? It's, it's the output. output. It's the output. Because like this is a boost average model, so we only care about the output capacitance. So we're neglecting the R. Do the flying capacitors not play a factor in it? Yeah, because like this is a this is the average model over one switching cycle. So this is like th this is already average over one switching cycle. So the dynamics of the uh, flying capacitor are not included. We're just showing that the average model of the two level works for for seven level because the average is the same over one switching cycle. Yeah. So uh, so let's continue. So basically it has two loops. The current loop, that is this one, so it's sensing the inductor current and uh, following a reference that is in phase, that is in phase with the input voltage, so such that it's, the, it's driving the power factor to one. And also the voltage loop is sensing the output voltage, and it it it, it provides a, a scalar to the uh, reference current that's varying with the load. And essentially, what it does is that uh, if you analyze this whole tr transfer function with the impedance, it's trying to emulate a resistor at the output. Uh, sorry, at at the input such that the power factor is one. Um, so we can actually write it uh, based on, so the GC is the current loop compensator, and then GID, uh, control to input uh, uh, transfer function. Okay, so we can actually derive the input impedance of the PFC. And now uh, we want this to be, so, and because the uh, reference current is a rectified sign, and if the line frequency is 60 hertz, and so the rectified sign is 120 hertz. So we want the impedance to be resistive at 120 hertz, uh, and also maybe at even higher frequencies. So it's because it's a rectified sign, it contains like harmonics. So uh, so then we like how do we how do we um, you know drive this this impedance to be to be uh, to be the equivalent uh, resistive uh, resistive uh, sorry resistor. So um, here are two parts of this equation. So uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, resistive in, uh, impedance or uh, admittance, we y1 needs to be dominated by this guy, uh, our equivalent, and y2 needs to be really small. So now uh, both of this actually, uh, if you look at this equation, so this uh, the compensator times the transfer function uh, is the loop gain of this system. And now, like w if we just take a look at these two equations, we can see that uh, the loop gain GC times GI D, GLD D needs to be really high such that the first term is, is approximately, uh, is very close to the R equivalent, and the second term is, is very small. So, uh, so uh, in order to achieve a high power factor on the input side, we have to have a high loop gain of the control system. So let's take a look and plot the body, body plot of the current loop gain. So usually with the Usually we uh, design our uh, loop gain to have a crossover frequency uh, that's 10 times lower than the switching frequency. Uh, and uh, uh, from the transfer function, we can actually derive a resonant pole at this frequency. And so what that means, like if the, so if you take a look at this uh, equation for the resonant pole, we can actually see that the smaller the L, it, um, it pushes the uh, resonant frequency uh, it pushes the resonant pole frequency further to the, uh, like to a higher frequency. So like uh, so, traverse from like travel from from the crossover frequency to the resonant pole. Uh, if the pole is at a higher frequency, you have a low uh, like relatively low gain at uh, 120 hertz. So which means that if smaller L will uh, will be uh, like smaller L. You, like with smaller L, you will have a lower gain at 120 hertz, and which means that your input impedance is not as resistive. And so we can actually uh, just plot the imp uh, input impedance. So, so Y1, Y2, and Y are plotted, and we can see that at 120 hertz, at 120 hertz, the uh, the input input emittance phase is actually positive. 
So which means that the current is leading the voltage. And uh, in, the early, in the early experiment result, we, ac we actually see that, uh, like we actually saw this effect that the, the, so this is the input current and this is the input voltage. And with, with the 10, 10 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz crossover frequency, we, we actually uh, uh, saw that the, the input current is leading the input voltage. And so current phase leading is not actually, it's not a new problem. In, in the airborne system, power system, like in airplane, they operate the line frequency at much higher frequency, like say uh, 300 to 400 hertz. And there, uh, so, and so that the um, gain at that frequency is actually also very low. So in order to solve this, people actually propose a, something called input feed forward control. That is adding this two uh, feed forward terms to compensate for to, to cancel the, 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 the disturbance from the input voltage. And so let's see uh, exactly how this works. So um, in, in, the, in, the, in the feed forward method, there's partial feed forward. That's, all, that, that's only that you sense the input voltage and you divide it by the output voltage to, uh, and you add this term to the, to the control effort. And then there is complete feed forward that actually, if you go back to the differential equation, you can calculate uh, how much uh, how much due ratio you need from the inductor current. Uh, so, and uh, we can again calculate the input impedance by uh, uh, including these two terms. So, I'm not sure why. It's, okay, so so uh, so this is the paper that talk, uh, that talks about the. Uh, feed forward current loop control. And uh, so we can see that w with no feed forward, the phase uh, at 120 hertz will be uh, positive. And at partial feed forward, uh, the phase will be distorted at higher frequencies, but at 120 hertz is still a zero phase uh, impedance. And if with complete feed forward, we can completely cancel the disturbance both from the control and the input voltage such that the impedance is always uh, uh, resistive. And with that, we chose, we chose uh, partial feed forward because that this is relatively easy to implement because we just need to sense this node and then divide it by the output. How robust is all this feed forward business here against the, you know, uncertainty in the parameters uh, or other things that you're not considering in the design? Uh, so you, you know, you, you're assuming you have certain parameter values and then you're assuming like right. a very specific uh, average model that comes, uh, you know, you show that uh, you were saying that that average model happens to be the same average model. So you, there is a, there are a bunch of underlying assumptions right. that really simplifies the model that you are using for control design. How that do changes in any of those assumptions uh, affect this with a feed forward control? Because that's, feed forward is pretty sensitive to this thing. Right, so I, 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 so I guess that's why you need both feed forward and feedback. Like the feed, so because uh, if you know a system model, right? So then the, 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 the dynamic, sure. right, and and then so 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 like if you know the system model and you use the feed forward, then you would just calculate the ideal case, right? and then but the feedback will just uh, you know drive that to the uh, like your desired uh, the value. So so I guess the feedback here is is trying to compensate for the non-idealities. Okay, so, the, so the feedback you have not calculated yet about it, right? Have you? Uh, yeah, I think that that's like the well. So 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 this is like this part is the feedback. I see, but you didn't talk much about it. You were just talking about the feed forward terms. Uh, right. So so the feedback is already like so 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 this, like so okay. this impedance is already a, yeah, yeah. a loop gain with loop gain, so it's already feedback. Um. So. Yeah, it's the same because because at the beginning of the presentation, we just we just derived that the model is the same as, as the Boltzmann model. Okay, so, so do you have any special control for the line at the voltage? So uh, that's a good question. So because um, we have a few papers that talks about like the active balancing and the natural balancing of the sorry the flying capacitor uh, voltages. Um, we have uh, so by actively means that like you you sense the capacitor voltage and then you are trying to adjust the due ratio to uh, to achieve the 
the nominal voltage. Or the even level flank capacitor has actually a stronger neutral balancing mechanism. So even level actually is more balanced than the, the, the odd level. Uh, so if, yeah, here we're using odd level, but you know, that, discovery, that discovery is actually after this work. So um, yeah, hopefully, and actually in the new hardware world. You mean that without any, so this, this one may, may not balance? Yes. Uh, it, it, will, it won't be unbalanced, but like it will, it will because of the, because of the passive, like the resistive uh, path in the in the uh, in the circuit, it will it will like reach another steady state value that is a little bit off to the uh, nominal value. I can show you the experiment result later. You just you just put as. Yeah. Okay. So first of all. Uh, you will see an experiment that, like we have done uh, from seven level to thirteen level, and um, the flank capacitor voltage balancing is not as bad as you think. That's the, that's the first thing. And second thing is that with even number of flank capacitor uh, multi levels, the balancing is really a how do I say this like a really stable system compared to uh, uh, out level. And uh, I mean, if you're interested, I can I can send you the paper. But the experiment results of like because our group has been doing this topology for a very long time, and uh, the flank capacitor voltage uh, is in this case it's not really uh, like like the the major consideration I guess I would say this. Uh, but yeah, but if you're interested, I can send you those papers. Um, so let's continue. Uh, so we also implemented a phase lock loop uh, in this uh, control. So, so because you know measuring because like all these are relatively high voltage and high voltage sensing usually carries a lot of noise. And so we like what we do is like we actually sense the input voltage with a PLL and then we generate a clean um, rectified sign signal for the current reference by like using this angle. And once we know this angle, we can also Detect the zero crossing, and uh, we control the uh, active rectifier to switch at uh, zero crossing. Um, and that's also a, so. So that PLL is implemented in the microcontroller. So then this is the hardware prototype. Uh, so you can see the active rectifier, seven level uh, FCML, and this is in the front. And this is the, in the back. We have the flank capacitors and the inductors. Uh, so uh, so we have actually twelve. I don't know why it's a typo. So, so a 12 uh, gain system, 100 volts uh, switches, and then in total, these two inductors adds up to 44 microhenry. And we have a very efficient, compact uh, bootstrap uh, circuit for gate drive power. And we'll show you in the next slide. So basically, uh, so this is the um, flank capacitor multi-level switches. So this is the high, most uh, the highest switch, and this is the low side switch, and and then to Provide the gate drive power. So, for example, if this switch is on, the uh, 16 volts will charge this capacitor, and then go through this LDO, and then provide the power to the isolated uh, gate gate uh, driver. And so, it, it can kind of uh, goes in a cascaded fashion. That and then you just go. Uh, and so, if this two switches are on, it charges this cap and provide the power to the next levels uh, switch. So. Uh, the components are relatively uh, simple. It just to, contains uh, one LDO, one dial, and one capacitor for each stage. And then uh, compared to our previous method with the isolated power supply IC, it's, um, uh, it's more efficient and takes uh, less space on the, on the PCB. So here is the experimental waveform. So, uh, so we tested, so this is the universal AC input. Uh, uh, PFC, so like we test it at the high line and low line. So high line is uh, 240 volts uh, uh, RMS AC, and low line is 120 volts RMS AC. And and so here's the V out, so it's the output DC, and you can see that the multi-level waveforms, and also uh, you you will see that the um, input voltage and current are, are are in phase. So yeah, is that yeah. something that you require? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, because uh, so so usually so for any grid tech uh, 
like high power AC, uh, a single phase AC converter that's tied to the grid, and it has a power factor uh, requirements because like if 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 you have high power and your phase are your phase are uh, so first of all you know, like in order to reduce the 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 VA rating of the converter like the power the power factor has to be as close to one as possible. The second is that if you have different power factors and then it will be like there will be a lot of harmonics in the grid. So uh, so that's the regular. Actually, uh, later I will show the typical limits of the regulation. So this waveform com confirms uh, our theory and also like our analysis on the on the, on the control. And also, uh, you can see that as 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 we discussed, like the the balancing problem is is still there. Like here, you you can see a little bit like 10 10 volts imbalance, and here you will see uh, 20 volts imbalance. And uh, and so like this is the like as as you said, like this is still a problem that we need to solve. That but actually we uh, when we switch to sixth level or eight level, this balancing mechanism is much better. Uh, so here is the data uh, for power factor, THD, and the efficiency. So uh, the power factor uh, is for mo like for most of the range is uh, very close to one, and the the input current THD is is that like the is, is how much noise you, you have in your uh, input current. And so this is a typical uh, uh, regulation, and we are way below that. And with Highline, we achieved 99.07% uh, uh, efficiency. Um, so, and we do. There's a class in here next. Yeah. So okay. Right. Yeah, so, so, so like here's the comparison, and we know that we're the best, so like we have, power, have higher power density efficiency, so let's just keep that. And so uh, we identified the current phase leading is a problem uh, because of the small, in, small, input, uh, small input inductor, and we identified that the uh, old solution, a uh, very old solution of the input feed forward control is actually the solution to our new problem. And then we, how, we demonstrate a 1.5 kilowatts universal input AC uh, PFC and with high power density and efficiency. So I think I think that's it. So. I thought that you had a whole bunch of more slides. Uh, no, no, no. It was, it was already like the results. Yeah.